Hello Kings, Queens, Nerds, and Geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to another video. Now guys, sorry I haven't posted in a while, but of course, minus yesterday's video, but thank you guys, I have to say this again, thank you guys again for 100 subscribers, which is pretty fucking awesome, and like, I, it took me two years to get to 100, but hey, slow and steady wins the race, right? But hey, uh, anyway guys, welcome to Fallout Equestria, part two of chapter 39. And I'm really curious. Also, guys, you notice I changed the little background now. Oh, um, I should be starting doing this again, the changing thing, because um, I think I should start doing it for recent events that happen, especially uh, for all this between the pink, when I'm going into Canterlot and the pink cloud, um, Steel Hooves' is death, and, of course, finding out the truth about behind the, uh, the, uh, the statuettes. And I'm really curious to find out what Pip's going to go through, because now, what's, uh, sorry, I'm been a while, Velvet Remedy no longer wants to be with Pip. And, and, uh, of course, um, after, uh, what's his name, I am sorry guys, it's been a while, and I'm kind of been off lately, but off lately. Anyway, uh, Calamity is going to drop her off at Tempany Tower. And it's going to be difficult for... It's going to be difficult for her. And probably me. Just going through all this. And, uh... Oh, man. Still kind of emotional about it, I, I'll be honest. Um... Of course, there's the, the situation with, uh... With uh, Derpy Hooves being irradiated as hell and can't be near her adopted daughter. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry. Cranberry just got on my face. Um, but all this happened all at once. You know, all this is just thrown in. They had the funeral and hip, hip. Has that thing? Has her, her pit buck fused to her arm? So it says in the image right there, you can see it. Um, yeah, man, all this stuff, man. Well, anyway, I've been babbling too long. I think we should get right into the story because I am eager to find out as much as you are who are watching this with me, and those who have already seen it are probably like, oh boy, this fuckers are this fuckers in for a treat. That's what probably some of you are like right now. I, I, leave in the comments if you're like that right now. Hold on. I'm going to actually... I want to see how... I don't know exactly how many chapters there are of this, but... Um, hey, I'm willing to go all the way for just for this story and for you guys, so... Ditsy Doo's hooves touched down the docks of Friendship Island. I'd the nice being able to approach Friendship City without being shot at, ain't it? Calamity asked me as he hopped out of the back of the wagon. Yep, I said, mimicking his accent decently. He chuckled. Ditsy Doo detached the wagon from herself, the lead lined cloak fluttering. She had been disappointed but understanding about the lack of muffins. Calamity had been concerned when my stay at Ten Pony Tower had proven so short lived. But without homage, and with Pegasi in black carapace-like armor walking through the public areas of the ritzy building, I had found myself without reason or desire to stay. Watching a couple armored enclave ponies looking into the window of my locked-up former cheese shop as they chatted about how they should require hero discounts was the final buck that drove me back outside. A guard pony was approaching us, her eyes shifting between the two Pegasi. So it's a visit from the great and benevolent enclave, is it? Calamity coughed, stomping a bit. Not hardly. Oh, really? The guard asked, moving closer. Then let me see your flank. I raised an eyebrow at that, but Calamity turned, taking the anti-radiation barding in his teeth and pulling it up over his flank, revealing the scar in the shape of a cloud and lightning bolt that had destroyed his cutie mark. Huh, all right then, the guard mare said, relaxing visibly. Welcome to Friendship City. She gave us a pleasant smile. Her eyes scanned over the wagon, then looked at Ditsy Doo, widening in surprise. 
ditzy? The Wasteland Survival Guide ditzy? ditzy Do gave a happy clop at the recognition. DJ had said you were a ghoul, but he never said you were a glowing one. ditzy Do set down her chalkboard and wrote on it before kicking it over to the guard. Glow is new. Too much splendid valley. Friendship City can fix? The guard read the chalkboard and looked uncertain but hopeful. Well, if there's any pony who could help, it'd be Dr. Freshwater. She's in charge of the science station built into the Friendship Island facility. She created the water purifiers about a decade back and has spent the last few years working on unlocking the mysteries of what she calls the Children of the Bombs. I found that interesting how she was recognized. That's awesome. That means Ditsy's famous! God, I like how she's just like the equivalent of that shop owner in, Meg in Megatone. I can't remember her name, but she always has that cheerful voice. She has that Minnesota accent. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm so sorry, guys. I've been drinking a lot of cranberry juice. I've been eating it. Don't ask why. Anyway. Oh, cheery. I thought out loud, suspecting that I might very well fit into that category at this point. Life Bloom had magically purged me of taint, but I had been exposed to a lot of it, both through direct contact with the dirty IMP Lake and Mariponi, and later in trace aerosol amounts from the leak in the safe room. According to Life Bloom, all my internal organs were in the right places, and I hadn't started to change size or grow wings, but the taint had altered me on a fundamental biological level. According to the Unicorn, I was closer to being an alicorn than being a pony. I did not consider this a good thing. The goddess claimed the alicorns were improved and superior, better suited than ponies to survive and thrive in the new world, and their natural successors. I felt a stranger in my own skin, though. The guard gave me a look. Anything I can help you with, friend? I thought a moment. We're here to help Ditsy do, and we'll stay however long that takes. Can you give us a quick picture of Friendship City? The guard nodded. You bet I can. Basic rundown is this. Friendship City tries to be a good place for decent ponies to live with as much freedom and safety as we can offer. The island makes that pretty easy. We don't get much trouble from raiders or slavers out here, usually just the occasional sea serpent or radigator. We occasionally get refugees or folks looking to settle down. Uh, we do the best we can for them, although we're beginning to run out of room. Raspberry Tart wants to start building shacks around the base of the main city, but Mayor Black sees is impeding the expansion. She doesn't want Friendship Island becoming a shanty town. I nodded, taking mental notes. Friendship City is run by a council of three August ponies. Dr. Freshwater, who I already told you heads up the science station, Mayor Black sees, who speaks for the general citizenry, and Chief Lantern, who's head of the guard. If you're looking for temporary housing, your best bet is at the Warm Smiles Inn. You can also seek refuge in the common room for free, but I don't recommend it. The guard scowled. That place is run by Raspberry Tart. The mayor says she runs things crooked. Now, I don't know about that, but I do know she takes advantage of the lack of supervision she's fostered around that place. Ditsy Doo bristled and neighed, stomping a hoof. At my questioning look, she trotted over and recovered her chalkboard erasing it with her hoof and writing. RT does bad business. No muffins for her. The guard began to lead us around to the science station entrance which backdoored into the docks. Despite the city's name, the entrance looked anything but friendly. Thick armored slabs operated by pneumatics sealed the science station with armor-shielded turrets covering the approach. There was no lock and no terminal, just a camera. The door could only be opened by some pony inside. A little green mat of faux grass and white flowers lay at the foot of the door, saying welcome. Raspberry Tart is head of the Merchants' Union. Mayor Black Seas says she's building a case to get her thrown out of the city, but the others won't act unless they have proof, for fear that she'll take too many of the merchants with her. The girl rolled her eyes. That is, assuming she could even get out the front door. The guard waved a hoof at the camera, smiling. I heard the turrets power down as the thick slab slid open with a deep-throated hiss. Now, I'm afraid you'll have to turn in your weapons at the door, the guard mayor cautioned. Friendship City's a friendly place, friends, and we want to keep it that way. You'll get them back once you leave. 
I recommend you take a moment to introduce yourselves to Mayor Blacksea's as soon as you get Ditsy Doo settled in. You'll find her in the Blacksea Supplies section. Now she then smiled to Calamity. Now this part here reminds me of a different game, not Fallout. I've never uh, encountered a place where I had to give up my weapons uh, to get in in any Fallout game I've played. But there is one place I in a, another game that required this, and this was Bowerstone. Uh, it was Bowerstone in um in um in Fable. If you guys have ever played that Fable, uh, the first Fable game, and you come across a town after you leave the uh, guild. You come across a town. Uh, you come across a town to the uh, right of the gu he heroes uh, heroes guild academy, and once you leave there, you go to the right. You go to Bowerstone. A guard will stop you once you enter. And take, have you com it will confiscate your weapons, and so every time you enter the town, your weapons magically disappear, but then they come back as soon as you leave. So that's basically what that just reminded me of, which is a sidetrack, guys. Sorry. And I imagine you'll want to be paying a visit to Radar, a resident Dashite. Calamity gaped in dumbfounded surprise. Radar still alive? He gasped. And he's here? Yeah. He's ancient as dirt, but still flapping his wings. He was in charge of the science station back when Friendship City was founded. Helped turn the city into the place it is. I blinked, suddenly remembering a chapter from the Wasteland Survival Guide on the founding of the city somewhere. I'd only skimmed the chapter at the time I read the book. After all, I had been more interested in basic survival tips than grandiose concepts like settlement building. And then I remembered Calamity's assertion that a Pegasus had helped string up the rope bridges, connecting the freestanding sections of Friendship Bridge. The guard grinned at Calamity's expression. I take it you weren't really expecting to see another dash out in your lifetime. I giggled at my companion. You might want to pick up your jaw before you come in. Calamity was turning in his battle saddle at the guard station just inside, when a water-blue unicorn pony with a short shock of raspberry mane and matching short tail trotted up with a sense of urgency. Dressed in her lab coat, she looked very scientific. Hello, everypony. Welcome to the Friendship City Science Station, where we're making a better tomorrow for all pony kind. Please, please come in, she encouraged. I'm Dr. Freshwater. This is my facility. Please make yourselves at home. The name Don't touch Freshwater. Anything, she shook my hoof, then spun immediately to Ditsy. Ditsy do, is it? Dr. Freshwater asked, floating on a pair of glasses and trotting over to get a closer look at our glowing ghoul Pegasus. She floated out a small device that began to clickety click, just like the radiation sensor in my pit buck. Ditsy do nodded, apparently at ease with the abrupt invasion of personal space. Let's quickly get you into a radiation testing chamber, shall we? My, your output is impressive. Is this a new condition? When did you become like this? Where did you get such exposure? No, no, don't stop to read anything, just come along. The doctor was already trotting away, motioning with her tail for Ditsy Doo to follow. Let's get you all hooked up. You know, Did I really wish they didn't cut out Ditsy's tongue. Because I really want to hear the small all things that Ditsy would say. I want to hear what she would actually say. I know she can write things on board, but she usually writes things in quick, short sentences to make things quick and easy. So, but, in this case, yeah, she has no tongue, so that makes me sad that I can't hear what she's saying. It'd be really cool if she could regenerate it. Which, actually, that should be a thing. Why didn't she regenerate her tongue? Ditsy do glanced back over her wings giving us a look that I couldn't interpret because her eyes were doing that weird thing of hers again. Then she fluttered off after an impatient Dr. Freshwater, who seemed eager to poke and prod her in the name of science. She'll be all right, won't she? I asked a passing lab pony. Oh, yeah, sure. The pony drawled. Once she's got the glow in one strapped in, she'll stay on the safe side of the glass. I meant ditzy do. I said crossly and the lab pony ambled away. I'm sure she'll be fine, Calamity assured me as he flew up next to me, battle saddle free. Dr. Freshwater seems a bit odd, sure, 
but if she can help Ditsy do get back to Silver Bell any time sooner, well, I'm sure the old man will be happy to put up with the test. I have a bad feeling about this. I have a bad I feeling about this. Guys, I have a bad feeling about this. Ditsy, please be okay for this. I want you to go see your adopted daughter. <sighs> disliking the idea. This is why we were here. Why Ditsy had wanted to come. But that didn't make me feel comfortable with it. I hope they did right by her. Zebra potions. The elderly Pegasus insisted proudly when Calamity rather bluntly asked about his longevity. Radar thumped a sienna hoof against his chest, wincing slightly, and exclaimed, Ain't nothing better. Them stripers have unlocked all manner of secrets with their bruins. You'd be amazed. Actually, I can believe it. I told the wrinkled old sienna pony, whose close-cropped mane might have been white even before the turn of the century. I chuckled, eyeing Calamity, who looked caught between an urge to dash and a desire to break into squeeze of, Oh my gosh! It was a reunion he had never expected, with a pony he had never known. I'm, I, I'm just imagining, um, uh, guys, you remember that scene where Fluttershy is just like, you know, prancing around, or when, um, Twilight looked like she had a pee, I think. I think that's, oh, did she have to pee? I don't remember. He's like, gotta pee, gotta pee, gotta pee. That's what I'm imagining. But with a sm huge smile on his face, that's what I'm imagining Calamity right now. Equestrian Wasteland seemed to have overwhelmed him. That darned upstart young and freshwater may usurp my position on the city council, even taking over my place as head researcher, but she can't force me to retire. Not while there's still plenty of life and mind left in me, Radar insisted. I'm as fit as I ever was. To prove it, the old Pegasus stretched out his wings and flew halfway across his loft in the back of the science station. He made it a full three yards before having to land, wheezing frightfully. Whoa there. Calamity said, the spell he seemed to be under breaking. He flew up to the wobbling elderly Pegasus, trying to steady him, but Radar pushed the younger Dashlight away. I said I was fit. Don't need no help. He looked between That's us. a stubborn old man if you didn't ever hear Now, one. who are you folk and what can old Radar do you for? Well, I'm Calamity, my friend said warmly, and this is my best friend, little Pip. I'm a Dashlight down from the clouds for about seven years now. I thought I was the only one around. I mean, I heard stories of you, but you left the Enclave so long ago. And now they've come back, Radar pointed out. Hell of a bad bit of timing. Calamity nodded morosely. Radar looked Calamity up and down. Tell me, what do you think they're here for? I don't know, Calamity admitted. But I don't think that he is trying to save the wasteland. The elderly Pegasus smirked. Ah, oh, so you don't buy the horse apples they're shoveling over the radio none, either. Calamity shook his head. Good buck. I was beginning to think it was just me. And you, what's your name? Radar turned to me. And how about you, youngin? You think they come down from the big old sky to save your tail? Little Pip, I reminded him. And no, no, I definitely don't. Radar smiled, nodding sagely. Well, way I see it, it's got to do with the Sustainable Pegasus Project. That's the key to the Enclave's power. How so? I asked. Agriculture, you silly corn, Radar stated. Without the towers, the Enclave can't feed the ponies. Pegasus, I wouldn't be able to survive cut off from the cloud curtain. Remember when you asked about what we ate up there, and I joked about cloud seeding? Calamity had told us, referring to a conversation we had had the morning after Pinky Bell's farm. I don't know what them towers were originally meant to do, but I know what the Enclave is repurposed them to do, and that's to enchant clouds for miles around them so you can grow crops right up out of the sky. Without that, Radar insisted. The Enclave falls. Red Eye plans to take control of the... SPP. He wants to control the weather. Radar scoffed, muttering under his breath. Good luck with that. I remembered what Calamity said back in Spike's cave. 
Only time they can act as one is when they're feeling threatened. And from their perspective, Radar surmised, it's him or them. Luna shuddering moonquakes, I cursed, getting a raised eyebrow from the elderly. Okay, you're, you're, I, I feel that your, your, your swears are getting less and less vulgar, so. And I whispered, she does that a lot from Calamity. We could have seen this coming. I looked at Calamity with sullen weariness. When we first learned what Red Eye was messing with the Philadelphia of Tower for, we could have at least guessed the Enclave would be stepping in sooner or later. By the time we'd left Canterlot, we should have known for sure. I bit my lower lip. It was only a matter of time. The moment they cottoned onto Red Eye's plan. Ain't like the Enclave has been paying the Equestrian Wasteland all that much attention, Calamity told me. At least it never seemed like they did to me. A few scouting parties every year. Wait. Radar suddenly flew up to me. It's not pressing against mine. You said your name was Little Pip. Uh, yes. I stammered, taken aback. You ever been to the Ministry of Awesome? Before the grand and mighty enclave tore all the candlelight down from the mountain? I watched the monitor its red eye keyed up the sequence. Y'all have been to the Ministry of Awesome before? Calamity asked Radar, unable to conceal his shock. Yeah, I was. Radar replied. It was decades ago, not long after they burned my cutie mark off me. I was hoping to find answers. He looked at us as the monitor came to life, showing first static, and then a scene of the MAW basement, the shield dominating the center. I didn't get no farther than that security station, and I zoomed out of there, leaving the whole damn place on high alert behind me. But I did manage to snatch up this little gem from the security logs. I watched the monitor. The timestamp on the log was old, a few years post-apocalyptic. What did you mean, good luck with that? I asked as I watched the minutes tick by on the recording. What now? When I said Red Eye was planning on taking over the SPP, I reminded him. You said, good luck with that. Radar made a sound of understanding. Well, the whole damn enclave has been trying to get into the central hub for generations now. If they can't do it, I don't see how Red Eye has a chance. He's got a plan, I said confidently. Oh, does he now? Radar scoffed. Well, I'd love to hear it. Cause that place is locked up tighter than my ex-wife's anus. Oh, goddesses. How I did not need the images that conjured. Oh, god. Place has the best defenses Equestria could build. Has a super shield so round, so powerful, really nothing's know. been able to penetrate it. Suppose it has super guns, too, but they're all inside the shield, and that shield is so over designed that they're pretty much useless. I know the Enclave has built a whole base around it, Calamity added. God, I put images in my head. Whole mess of troops is some place that no pony can get into. Radar chuckled, grinning at Calamity. Never found any pony who could get through. Enclave High Council figures the shield's keyed only to Rainbow Dash herself, and Dash had no surviving kin. So when she left, she pretty much screwed the powers that were out of their prize. Yeah, bet they took that well. Calamity grinned back. Deemed her a traitor, that's what they did. Radar spat. Send Griffin Merks to kill her and bring back her head. Hope some pony wearing rainbow dash around their neck might be able to walk through. Calamity and I both gasped in horror. I turned from the monitor. The Enclave wanted... That's... Goddesses. Radar agreed grimly, correcting me at one point. Please, no, well, they weren't exactly the Enclave quite yeah. yet, but they were getting there right quick. What happened? Radar started simply. Well, either they never got the head, or they did, and it didn't work. Hey, Pinkie Pie, you hear? Rainbow Dash's voice floated up from the monitor. I shifted back to see the rather bedraggled Cyan Pegasus walking into the basement. The security camera zoomed in, following her. 
You in here? Pinkie Pie. She tried again, sounding so small in the vast room. I brought him, just like you asked. What's this all about? Her words echoed off of the walls. The light of hope in her eyes slowly diminished. Rainbow Dash stopped a few yards in front of the shield, the magical light painting shadows across her features as she looked around. You weren't kidding about those health potions, by the way. I'm down to my last one, and I still need to make it out of that pink stew outside. That stuff's... awful. The room remained silent and still. The light in her eyes went out entirely, her expression becoming painfully sad. You're not even here, are you? Rainbow Dash asked, the emptiness about her. Guess that means you didn't make it either. Rainbow Dash stepped solemnly through the shield. She walked up to the little pedestal sitting at its center, and the memory orb box resting upon it, its lid slightly ajar. Rainbow Dash nudged it open with her nose, revealing three memory orbs and spaces for three more. The second, third, and fifth were missing. I don't know what you needed those for, or who this little pip you mentioned in your note is, but I hope it's as important as you said it is. Rainbow Dash frowned, her voice soft and sad. She reached into her saddlebag and pulled a memory orb out with her teeth, gently sitting it to the side reserved for the butterfly orb. It wasn't easy getting these things, especially with Gilda on my tail. But even she isn't brave enough to follow me into Gilda? what's become of Canterlot, much less my ministry. She put the star orb in its resting place. But she's waiting for me out there. And after that pink crap, I'm not sure I can take her. Rainbow Dash fished the final memory orb out, the one to be placed in the holder with her own cutie mark. She paused, staring at the little emblem of the cloud and its rainbow lightning bolt, then sighed and put the orb into its place. Rainbow Dash shifted her attention back to the orb in the fourth holder, the balloon orb. But I trust you. You know that. You said this was important, and I believe you. And I wouldn't leave my friend hanging. Even even after she was... The last word was barely a whisper. Gone. A single tear trailed down her cheek as she gave a weary smirk. One last prank, right? Together as always. She lifted a hoof and pressed the orb box close. The click of the lock loud in the sepulcher room. I reached out and touched the monitor screen, tears welling in my own eyes. Rainbow Dash turned and started to walk away. As she reached the inside of the shield, she stopped. Her face screwed up with determination. But you know what, Pinky? Since you're not here, I'm changing the rules. Rainbow Dash spun around and trotted over to the mainframe on the far side of the shielded area. If some pony comes poking around here, I want to know. I'm setting an alarm to go off in every Ministry of Awesome Hub. If I'm still alive, I want to meet this little pip of yours. Dash paused. Sorry, Pinks, she said, looking back over her shoulder. <clears throat> Hope you don't mind. I watched the rest of the recording in stunned, comprehending silence. French. She committed suicide. Is that what you're telling me? That Rainbow Dash committed suicide towards the end? And she died in her ministry. Where was the skeleton? I don't remember. I don't know how to feel about that. Rainbow Dash going out at... Yeah, the, the way she went out, yeah, was pretty fucking awesome. What the fuck did she do? What she what killed her first? Ship City rose above us. Concentric rings of stores and homes, connected by walkways and platforms that spun out from a central spiraling stairwell, ascending through the chimney-like open space like a plume of smoke, rising to the head of the Pony of Friendship. Crowds of ponies moved up and down the spiral stair, diverting onto the catwalks and merging with the traffic that surrounded the layers of scavenged material structures built into the interior walls of the massive statue. A city built from junk, 
a fair portion of it pulled from ships which had sunk in the harbor. A small forest of support beams further congested the lower levels. Ponies gathered around a watering hole called Sparkles, run by a friendly but slightly frazzled mare with the cutie mark of a sparkle cola on her flank. Her assistants moved between tables nearby, taking orders and delivering homogeneous deep-fried foodstuffs. From a radio nearby blared the sounds of heavy horns, marching drums, and rumbling thunder. Enclave music. Ponies stopped to stare at us as Calamity and I walked through Friendship City. Conversations died on unfinished sentences. For once, their gazes weren't oppressing me. It was the presence of a Pegasus in their midst that snatched their attention. Invariably, their eyes would quickly search on Calamity's flank. We no longer wore the anti-radiation barding, having left it with one of Dr. Freshwater's more amiable assistants. Without barding or a battle saddle, Calamity looked strangely naked beneath his desperado hat. At the sight of Calamity's dash-eyed brand, nervous faces broke into smiles. We were soon mobbed by strangers wherever we went, all offering friendly greetings to my Pegasus friend and his little mare companion. I had garnered no attention at all until two Friendship City security guards approached, wearing heavy barding and cheery pastel colors that closely matched their manes. Welcome to Friendship City, Calamity. One of them smiled, offering a hoof. Word of our visit had spread faster than the crowds had allowed us to travel. And you must be the stable dweller that DJ Pony keeps cheering for. It's an honor to meet you, miss. I felt myself blushing hard as I stared up at the security pony. Sorry about, uh, shooting you last week, the pony said, looking chagrined, offering me his hoof. I was reaching out to shake it when his dour partner groused solemnly. I'm not. I froze. The guard looked to his partner in dismay, but the other guard pony stood her ground. She shot those false parents right in front of him. She said, glaring at me. With bullets of fire... My hoof dropped back to the scrap metal floor. They call you Hellmare, you know. The guard glowered. The kids? The other guard, the buck, put a hoof over his face in embarrassment. All right, Nightbright, let's just go. He looked at us regretfully. Sorry about that, folks. As the two guards moved away, Nightbright looked back over her shoulder and mouthed slowly. Bullets. Of. Fire. Welcome to Black Sea Supplies. The black-maned indigo mare at the counter greeted us genially as she took in the sight of us. My name's Black Seas. I'm the mayor of this fine city and owner of this fine store. And you must be Little Pippin Calamity. She smiled. Word gets around. Thanks for stopping in. I looked around, feeling dazed. The small cargo ship that Black Sea Supplies was built out of had been cut apart and imported into the Pony of Friendship, then rebuilt almost completely. Metal flooring and rows of shells had been welded into the hold. Narrow metal stairs led up to the living quarters, which had once been a captain's cabin. An old model precursor to the terminal, a combination of monitor and intercom system, was built into the wall behind a counter that looked like it had been scavenged from a diner. Calamity fluttered forward to greet Mayor Blacksees. Pleased to meet you, he grinned back affably. Mind if I take a poke around your store? I'm looking to do some trading. Well, that's a damn fine coincidence, Blacksees grinned back. That's what Blacksees Supplies is here for, after all. We've got just about everything you might be looking for. Here, let me show you. I watched in foggy amusement as Blacksees and Calamity dove into business my Pegasus friend looking to unload a lot of what we had scavenged from the Ministry of Image in return for bottle caps, ammo, and medical supplies, with an emphasis on Rataway. Black Seas was a skilled and charismatic barter pony, though, and soon had him shopping for a gift for Velvet Remedy. Something to touch her heart and remind her that there really is good in ponies worth fighting for. My thoughts were still drowning in the cold reminder of Arbu, leaving me detached from my surroundings and the conversation in front of me. I barely reacted when the door opened and an arsenic-colored stallion brushed by, carrying a walking stick in his muzzle. 
I only reacted when the stick transformed into a magical energy blaster, and he fired it at the mayor. Tart says hello. Calamity was faster, flying into Black Seas, knocking her out of the path of the shot, and into a shelf of lunchboxes, sensor modules, and garden gnomes, which rained down upon the indigo mare. The blast of lethal magic struck a display of steam gauge assemblies, pulverizing it. My first reaction was to pull out little Macintosh, but with a start, I realized my most trusted weapon was not with me. Calamity pivoted, hooves dropping to the floor as he stood between the assassin and Black Seas. The stallion shifted to get another shot, realizing he would have to take Calamity out to get to his target. I lashed out with my telekinesis, lifting the arsenic-colored pony and pushing him against the far wall, where two shelves blocked his view of both my friend and the mayor mayor. I wrapped my magic around his neck, squeezing. The stallion kicked and flailed, his eyes bulging, the magic weapon dropping to the floor with a clatter. Black Seas was climbing back onto her hooves, a couple garden gnomes rolling off of her back, as the assassin lost consciousness. I released him. The mayor blinked slowly, shaking her head. Well, looks like your reputation as heroes is well founded, she said, wincing slightly from a sprain. Thank you for saving my life. That's ah, nothing. It's what we do, Calamity said. More for my benefit, I suspected, than hers. Why, well, I reckon he was out to kill you. The mayor frowned. I'm pretty sure Raspberry Tart was behind this, she proclaimed, trotting over to the old terminal. She pressed one of the buttons under the monitor and barked. Tart, I need to speak with you right now. The indigo pony tapped her hoof impatiently, glancing to Calamity. Would you be a deer and tie that bastard up? Her eyes dropped to the magical energy weapon on the floor. How the hell did Lantern miss that? I stepped up to where the weapon had tumbled, floating it upwards to examine it. It was a model I had never encountered before, but then again, I was barely knowledgeable about magical energy weapons. You might want to ask Grandpa Rattle about that, I suggested. The spell disguising the blaster as a stick was too similar to the old buck's magical research to be coincidence. I have a shotgun. I couldn't imagine Grandpa Rattle working with murderous ponies, though. At least, not willingly. I was suddenly fearful for that crazy old buck. The monitor flickered to life, showing the face of a grossly overweight Palm Grant mare with a yellow mane and an overly charismatic smile. Oh, Mayor Black Seas, how good it is to hear from you. Her words virtually oozed out of the speaker above the monitor. And to what do I owe the honor of your call this evening? <clears throat> you know exactly why I'm calling you murderous bitch. Black Seas spat, stomping her hoof. You just sent a pony to kill me. Hmm, language, she chided, her smile unfazed by the accusation. Now, now, it's hardly befitting of a mayor of our glorious city to use such a foul statement, or to go slinging such dreadful false accusations. So you deny it, then? Black Seas narrowed her eyes. Well, seeing as how the would-be assassin failed, I'm sure we can put this to rest after Chief Lantern has a day or two with him, and her interrogation room. Oh? The blob of a mayor looked surprised. He survived, then. Good, good. The sooner the chief can ferret out the true culprit, the better, no. Although it will cut into your opportunities for slander, more is the pity. I trotted up, floating the intended murder weapon in front of me. Black Seas looked at it, then back to Raspberry Tart. And I don't suppose you have any idea how a weapon like this could have been found on Friendship City? "'Shouldn't you be asking Chief Lantern that question?' she suggested. Black Seas nickered. "'We both know that anything that finds its way into Friendship City behind her back has gone through you.' The pomegranate mayor feigned offense. "'Despite what you claim, Mayor, the common room is not a den of smugglers and thieves. And as the voice of the ponies, I would think you should have more faith in them.' Her words washed over my ears like slime. 
Besides, let's be honest, if I wanted to kill you, I would never use such a crude method. I'd poison your food. Raspberry Tart got the reaction she was looking for. Black Sea's eyes widened just for a moment before narrowing again. The overmate mare virtually purred in pleasure. I was beginning to deeply and egregiously dislike Raspberry Tart. Now be a darling and keep me informed, would you, Mayor? Raspberry Tart pressured. What is this bitch's problem? Unit, I have a right to know about shenanigans that threaten the peace and safety of all of our little ponies. Of course. Mayor Black Seas groused before cutting the connection. The mayor's expression was cloudy. Slimy worm of a mare. Now Chief Lantern will have to spare guards for this viper just to make sure he doesn't have an unpleasantly life-ending accident before he can be questioned. She kicked one of the scattered garden gnomes. And now I'm going to be obsessing over my food. Is there any way we can help you? I offered. The mayor raised her eyebrows. Can you get a confession? She shook her head. You've already helped me more than I could ask. But... She thought for a moment. If you can sneak a listening device into her office above the common room, I may be able to catch her saying something about this mess that I can take to the council. I grinned, crossing my pip-buck-bound foreleg in front of me. Sneaky is one of my specialties. My plan was simple. I'll use my stealth buck to turn invisible, then I'll slip past Raspberry Tart's guards and defenses. Even if she's in the room, I'll be able to plant the listening device and get out unnoticed. I looked down at the MG stealth buck 2 set into my pit buck leg. I'd already used it to get in, and then out of Ten Pony Tower. The device hadn't had much time to recharge, but if I moved swiftly, and all went well, so I would only need about ten minutes. I don't like the timing of this, Calamity said, flying over me as I pushed my way through Friendship City towards Sparkles. My innards had stopped queezing after Life Bloom had purged me of taint, and over the last few hours my stomach had begun to rumble, reminding me that I hadn't swallowed anything other than water and rat away in days. At least half of my weakness was stemming from starvation. You think the attack on the mayor has something to do with us? I asked. Calamity had echoed my own concerns. For the attack to take place right after we walked into the store was a hell of a coincidence, and I was growing unfond of the coincidences. Well, no, Calamity admitted. Not us particularly. Between Red Eye and the Enclave and the death of the goddess, there's just too much going down right now for me to believe this is just happening by chance. He let out a growl of frustration and drooped into feet, hanging limply from his wings. Hell, for all we know, the Hellhounds might be plotting this. Pony napping and coercion ain't exactly outside their limited vocabulary. So this could be my fault too, I moaned, staring at the floor. I just go ahead and add it to the list already. Hey now. Calamity perked up, landing in front of me. None of this is your fault, girl. Red Eye's been plotting against the goddess and the Enclave since long before y'all stepped out of that stable, <coughs> he argued with confidence. He was working on ways to get into the Ministry of Awesome, and chances are he'd already found one. He did already have the Griffins to help shut down the security systems. All you did was bump up the clock on the Enclave's arrival. And I reckon that's probably a good thing if it throws a bump under Red Eye's wagon. I turned away, but Calamity grasped my head between his hooves and made me look at him, his wings flapping as he lifted back off the walkway. You're blaming yourself for those dead hellhounds. Maybe even steel hooves. My winds betrayed me. Well, you can just stop that nonsense right now, you hear? You got that bomb away from Red Eye and used it to take out a genocidal threat. What do you think Red Eye would have done with it if he hadn't? He stared into my eyes forcefully. At best, he'd have done the same himself. At worst, he'd have used it on a pony population center strong enough to stand in his way. Hell, he was already threatening Ten Pony Tower with it. 
I realized I was crying. Oh, damn it, little pip, Calamity said, his expression softening. Come here now. Let me get you something to eat. I followed him obediently. The crowd had thinned around Sparkles. The waitress mares were looking thankful for the respite. The music on the radio had been replaced with an authoritative voice. Colluding with a monstrosity in Splendid Valley which called herself the Goddess. This goddess was the mother of the horrific alicorns which had been tormenting the equestrian wasteland, endangering the lives of all good ponies like yourselves. But the fiendish plot of Red Eye and the goddess made the murders at Alicorn's hooves and magic pale in comparison. My face slapped into Calamity's backside as the Pegasus stopped abruptly, his ears up, listening. It was their intention to rip you from your homes and from your families, to force you to endure an agonizing, taint-driven transformation that would render you into a mindless slave. Red Eye and the Goddess have been working together not just to take your freedoms or your lives, but to annihilate individuality and to devour your very souls. I stumbled back, shaking my head. Then I joined Calamity, wondering what the Enclave was up to. If they thought the Goddess was so bad, I whispered to my friend, why did they try to ally with her? Naturally, the Grand Pegasus Enclave could not let this stand. We may have been gone for a while, but we have not forgotten our unicorn and earth pony allies down here. And we are not about to allow these abominations to violate and destroy all of you. That is why we detonated a mega spell bomb beneath the home of the goddess, the Maripony facility in Splendid Valley. My jaw dropped. The world seeming to spin they out from the, under me. They took the credit for that? And who the hell are you? Raspberry Tart spat as she saw me. What the hell are you doing in my loft? How did you get past my guards? I had planted the listening device and had been halfway out of the door when the stealth buck died. The tub of pony flesh wobbled around to face me from her place in the lounge bed behind her desk. Gizmo, get in here! I felt a pony move swiftly behind me, blocking my exit. Gizmo, escort our uninvited guest out! The bulbous pomegranate mare requested of the stallion behind me. Preferably through a window. Wait, I said, thinking swiftly. I'm here about the contract on Black Seas. Raspberry Tart raised a mocking eyebrow. What contract? Ah, uh, now I remember you. You were standing in the background when our good mayor called me up to start slinging accusations. She hefted up one of her slab-like hooves, signaling the stallion behind me to wait. What do you want? The gears in my head spun. The pony who tried to kill the mayor was sloppy and stupid, and now the mayor trusts me. I gave her my best conspiring smile. I could do the job easy, and correctly, but it won't be cheap. Raspberry Tart sighed. Do you really think I'm that stupid? Did you really think you could pull the wool over my eyes that easily? I found myself picturing the attempt to cover her with wool, the rolls of fat, the massive jowls. Not enough sheep in the world, I muttered aloud before I could stop myself. She rolled her eyes. You know, I really don't like being insulted, especially from home innovators. Gizmo, tear the legs off this little pony, won't you? Whoops. I cantered, circling to see Gizmo. My eyes widened as I took in the surgical scars and mechanical wings. Gizmo was a cyber pony almost certainly a refugee from Stable 101. Gizmo spun, spreading out his wings to slash at me. I dodged to the side, the blades of those wings whisking through the air inches from my eyes. I couldn't guess if those cybernetic wings would actually allow the Earth Pony to fly like a pegasus, but the feathers were razor sharp. Gizmo somersaulted, his wings lifting and slicing through the air at me as I dove for cover, casting about for something to use as a weapon. Gizmo spun again and bucked, turning the chair I had moved behind into a battering ram that knocked me over. My armor took the blow, leaving me winded but unhurt. 
Gizmo, stop playing with your food. Raspberry Tart ordered lazily. Just finish her already. I scrambled for the door. Gizmo jumped up onto the couch and leapt into the air, spreading out his wings. Maybe he couldn't actually fly with them, but they very well allowed him to glide. He swooped across the room and landed on me with all hooves, driving me into the floor. I focused, my horn glowing. I was weak and weaponless, but I'd fought my way through Canterlot, dammit, and Old Olney. There was no way I was going to fall to some two-bit crook's augmented mook. I felt a hoof press down against the back of my head as Gizmo shifted so he could angle a wing at my neck. Then, I heard the squelching sound as I telekinetically drove my screwdriver down through his ear and into his brain. Gizmo collapsed off of me, twitching. It took him almost a full minute to die. Pushing myself back up, I turned towards Raspberry Tart. All right, let's just try this again, won't we? Or I could just finish you off myself. Yeah, I don't think you could, I snarked. I'm not a pie. My horn glowed as I levitated Gizmo's body, pointing one of his razor wings towards her broad throat. Okay, <laughs> that was pretty funny. I don't think you could. I'm not a pie. <laughs> Wrote. Now, one last time. Raspberry Tart took fresh stock of me. You might just be useful after all. Chief Lantern was waiting with the mayor when Calamity and I returned to Black Sea Supplies. Did you get all that? I asked eagerly the moment I trotted through the door. Yes. Black Seas informed me with a heavy tone, her expression cloudier than ever. I drew up short. This was not the demeanor of a mare who'd just had her rival floated up to on a silver platter. And almost immediately afterwards, I got a call from Raspberry Tart reporting your attempt to barter for my murder. I stammered. Wait, wait, what? I... I was just trying to get her to say something that... I mean, I wasn't actually offering... Chief Lantern waved a hoof. Don't worry, girl. We know that. It would take an amazingly stupid assassin to negotiate a contract against a target she knew was listening through a device she had just planted. Oh. He breathed a sigh of relief. But Raspberry Tart covered her tail. Made it look like she was just playing along in order to bring another wannabe assassin to justice. We can't use anything she said to you against her. Calamity bristled. Well, how about a sick in that cyber pony on Little Pip? You were invading her home, Chief Lantern told me. Anyway, it doesn't matter now, Mayor Black Seas claimed. We've got bigger problems. Calamity whinnied. What now? Mayor Black Seas moved over to the terminal. Just after she called us, Raspberry Tart made another call. She pressed a button. An unfamiliar stallion's voice sounded through the speaker. Hello? Who is this? Well, hello to you too, darling. Raspberry Tart's voice slithered. We're all set for your visit. I've cleared the way. When your boys get here, the doors will be open and waiting for them. The package they're looking for doesn't suspect a thing. But we have one small setback. Those aren't words that I like, the stallion informed her coolly. You shouldn't be telling me words that I don't like. Mayor Black Seas is still going to be a problem, Raspberry Tart whinnied. The mayor and the security chief exchanged glances as they listened. I could hear a heavy sigh through the speaker. The mayor of that rusty monument you call a city was your responsibility. We're more than ready and capable of doing things the hard way if we meet any resistance. Um, of course, Raspberry Tart said, sounding a little worried now. The stallion neighed. Personally, I would prefer the hard way. Tends not to leave loose ends. No, no, no. No, that won't be necessary, darling. How long until we can expect your arrival? 
there was a snort from the unidentified stallion. Our raptors are eighty minutes out. Should give you plenty of time to fix your little problem. Or flee the city. The Enclave was coming for Friendship City. I... I could just turn myself over to them. I offered meekly. The ponies gathered in the council room with me stared appraisingly. What makes you think you're the one they're after? Dr. Freshwater asked, raising an eyebrow. Well... I grimaced. I had no reason for my assumption other than the timing and the fact that it always seemed to be me. Who else would it be? Oh, hell no. Calamity spat. He turned to the others. Y'all ain't handed any pony over to the Enclave. He paused, his determination melting into hope. Are you? The door opened behind us as Chief Lantern marched in, followed by several security ponies. Raspberry Tart's gone. Looks like she took one of the boats. Good riddance, Mayor Black Seas nickered. We can't worry about her now. Question is, do we fight, evacuate, or both? Well, do we even have enough boats to evacuate every pony? Dr. Freshwater asked, turning to the security chief. The pony shook his head sadly. Maybe we did about five years ago, but not any more. We can get maybe a third of the population packed into the boats we have, slightly less seeing as how Tart took one of them. To be fair, I noted disdainfully, she kinda took a whole one up herself. Calamity shook his head. If their target might be on one of those boats, they'll sink them all. Chief Lantern growled. Well, we fight then. That's what we have those harbor guns for. Dr. Freshwater looked at the others. Are we seriously not going to put negotiation on the table? Based on that recording, they only want one pony. How can we put the lives of every pony in the city at risk for just one? She stared at us imploringly. Shouldn't we even ask who they want? And if it's you? Calamity nickered. Then what? The doctor frowned. Well, then I try to get away. Alone. Can we try to communicate with them using Raspberry Tart's terminal? I suggested. If I was the Enclave's target, I was more than willing to give myself up to spare the city. And I was sure Calamity felt the same. But letting the Enclave close in on the city while we waited to find out who they were after felt like a tactical disaster. Not for the first time. I wondered what Steelhoods would recommend. Have recommended, the little pony in my head reminded me, bringing heavy clouds of sorrow. Chief Lantern shook his head. Already tried that. They're not responding. Definitely not a good sign. Sounds to me like they've decided to do this the hard way anyhow. I turned on my pit buck radio, listening to the Enclave's overriding broadcast to my ear bloom. I didn't expect to glean any real clue as to what they were up to, but I felt I'd better start keeping appraised of what they were saying. For the moment, I was only getting dark, funeral-esque marching anthems. Steele's funeral had been this morning. The loss of my friend wrapped my heart in chokingly tight sorrow, and the dour tones of the music were cutting at me like sharp metal wings. Don't bring back the emotions. Calamity was off assisting Chief Lantern. A quick inspection of the harbor guns had revealed sabotage, apparently part of Raspberry Tart's clearing the way for the Enclave. The damage had been inexpert, and Calamity was certain they could have at least half of the harbor guns working again before the Enclave arrived. But they had to work fast. I followed Dr. Freshwater to the observation room and stared through the anti-radiation window. Greenish-yellow light poured brightly through the glass. Inside, Ditsy Doo saw me approach the window and waved a wing. A device mounted into the wall clickety-clicked, reading the ambient radiation inside the room. All right, let's try it again. One of the lab technicians, a cream-coated unicorn with a cornflower blue mane, spoke into a microphone. Focus. The unicorn technician began to walk Ditsy Doo through the mental exercises that the young unicorn fillies and colts used to practice telekinesis. But Ditsy Doo wasn't a unicorn. 
She had no magic. What could they be expecting? Foosh. The radiation counter squealed as the light in the room became momentarily blinding. Ditsy Doo tumbled to the floor comically, the burst of energy from her body knocking her off kilter. Oh, that was pretty good. The unicorn technician cheered into the microphone, clapping his hooves together in applause. Keep that up and you'll be able to purge yourself of radiation in just a couple days. Inside the chamber, Ditsy Doo pranced joyfully. Now, let's go again, the unicorn said with a happy chuckle. But this time, try to keep centered so you don't keep knocking yourself over. I smiled to Ditsy Doo and applauded too. Okay, I think I know what's Somehow. going on. Because I know sometimes glowing ones will sprout out radiation all around them as a secondary attack. So... Watching her joy made the storm clouds over my own head scatter, if just for a little while. The music in my ear bloom ended, and a voice began to speak. I turned away from the glass, listening. I didn't want Ditsy Doo to see the expressions I expected to play across my face. Greetings, ponies of the equestrian wasteland. The Grand Pegasus Enclave embraces our earthbound brothers and sisters. I know many of you are mourning the loss of Canterlot, such an iconic symbol of the Equestria that was. But that royal city was destroyed centuries ago, and all that remained was a breeding ground for monsters and poisons. Sometimes, in order to allow the body to heal, we must cut off the infected flesh. I could feel the scowl forming on my muzzle. I didn't like where this was going. It felt like more than just an excuse for their attack on the Canterlot ruins. It's wrong. Burn away the diseased areas before the infection spreads. I winced as a blast of static cut through the broadcast, nearly making me kick off my ear bloom. Good evening, children! DJ Pony's voice burst into the airwaves. It's me again, your <laughs> pal DJ Pony. Coming to you from a secret location somewhere in the Equestrian Wasteland. You didn't think I'd abandon the Equestrian Wasteland just because of the Enclave, did you, children? Now, old DJ Pony ain't got a lot of time before Big Sister Enclave shuts this down. So let's get right to it, shall we? That's right. It's time for the news. Yes! Yes! The little pony in my head was yes! gleefully, letting out a multitude of yeses. Uh, now, first up, the I truth bet, about I bet you Hamid will make you say more yeses. What went down to Maripony. Now, I've got my information from irrefutable sources here, children. And I've got to admit, the Enclave is right about one thing. The goddess was as big and as bad a threat as they're making her out to be. But that's where the truth stops, and the lies begin. Irrefutable sources, I assumed, meant she'd been watching from the towers. But wait... Now, I don't know what the Enclave were out of Maripony for, but it sure as hell wasn't to take out the biggest threat the equestrian wasteland has ever known. No, that deed was performed by none other than your and my favorite heroine, the Stable Dweller. My ears were burning, but I was too happy just hearing Amage's voice, disguised as it was, to mind. And the bomb she used to do it was the very one Red Eye was threatening Tempony Tower with for weeks. Turns out, our heroine talked Red Eye into giving up his big trump card. Oh. Irrefutable sources, huh? Homage had watched my memories. So, that casts some serious doubt on the whole Red Eye Goddess Alliance the Enclave has been spouting off about. They're lying to you, children. Plain and simple. Now, DJ Pony still doesn't know what they're up to, but I can tell you this. The Grand Pegasus Enclave are not your friends. Now keep an ear out, cause I'll be... Another burst of static, and DJ Pony's voice was gone. I floated off my ear bloom and held it to my breast. Fuck yeah! Finally some truth has been played out! Thank you! Thank you, Homage! Yes! Basking in the knowledge that Homage was out there, still alive and fighting the good fight in her own very important way. Attention, citizens of Friendship City. The armor's altered voice boomed out over the city's public address loudspeakers. We are here to take into custody a Pegasus wanted for crimes against the Grand Pegasus Enclave. His name is Radar. 
You can recognize him by the following brand on his flank. I stared up at the nearest loudspeaker, a gray box attached to one of the support beams outside Sparkles. I just made it back to the watering hole and was waiting for Calamity's return when the Enclave announcement started. I checked my pit buck's clock. The Enclave was early. We had almost twenty more minutes, supposedly. The mayor had made her own announcement, urging ponies to return to their homes less than ten minutes ago. Mayor Black Seas had called it an exercise, knowing that panic would cost lives. But an exercise didn't have a lot of motivating power. The central chimney wasn't anywhere close to being cleared. Our raptors are eighty minutes out. But their armored troops were much faster. Failure to produce this Pegasus and turn him over to the Enclave will be considered an act of collusion. Prompt compliance will be rewarded. Refusal will be met with force. The ponies who had stopped to stare and listen began to panic. Ponies began racing up and down the stairs, pushing into each other. What would they want with the old man? A cobalt-coated buck screamed as he was knocked over the railing, falling three stories to slam heavily into the ponies racing about the floor below. Somewhere, the voice of a scared foal cried out. I launched out of my seat, looking around for the source of the voice. With a bang, the doors into the central chimney swung open, and the nightmarishly armored forms of four enclave pegasi moved in, their scorpion-like tails curling slowly, the antenna-like integrated weapons of their enclave armor pulsing with colored light. Every pony stay just where you are, one of the pegasi said. We are the enclave. We're here to bring one pony to justice. Many ponies stopped frozen in their tracks. Others raced for the nearest door, diving inside. I could hear the foal crying under the thunder of hundreds of frightened whispers. We will be searching the premises, the Pegasus informed the crowd. Do not attempt to hide. Do not attempt to flee. Do not attempt to interfere. Obey, and we will be out of your mains in short order. The Pegasus behind him stepped up, as the two behind started to fan out, moving through the crowd. The Pegasus called out, Any pony with information leading to the swift arrest of the Pegasus radar will be rewarded with a finder's fee of 5,000 bits. To their credit, not a single pony in Friendship City stepped up to take the offer. Fuck you, a mint-coated buck shouted from the spiral stairwell. The Enclave pony looked up at him. The gems on her armor glistened. The sounds of a magical energy weapon being discharged filled my ears. The ponies around the buck scattered as he was turned into a glittering pile of ash before their eyes. Two more ponies in the crowd began to run, trying to make it to the door of one of the shops. Two more glowing bolts of magical energy threaded through the crowd, striking down their targets. One of the ponies vaporized, her ashes scattering across the door she had been trying to reach. The other collapsed onto her side, screaming in pain. No. I repeat, do not attempt to hide. Do not attempt to flee. Do not attempt to interfere. Obey. I was trembling. If I had my sniper rifle, all four of them would be dead right now. One of the black-clad pegasi started to move through the patrons of Sparkles. She stepped close to me, walking around behind me as she looked me over. I forced myself to stand there silently, knowing that any action could put ponies in danger. She paused. Her visor turned towards the pit buck melted to my leg. Have her free wins, she whispered in revulsion, moving quickly past. I caught sight of the little wine-colored filly curled up under the foot of one of the spiral stairs, shivering and whimpering. My heart went out to her. I started to inch closer, hoping I could comfort her. I made it halfway up when she saw me, her eyes opening wide with utter terror. Helmer! She screamed, scrambling up and fleeing from the sight of me. No, don't run. Don't move. They'll... A shot of magical energy struck the filly. No! No. The no! What the fuck?! Momentum had carried the glistening pink ash as she glowed and disintegrated, fanning it out across the metal floor. My world shattered apart. I collapsed to my hooves, raising to my muzzle as if they could contain my screams. 
Damn it, Bright Wind, you just shot a filly. My whole body was shaking and couldn't stop. The tears couldn't stop. Goddesses, no. Fly steady, soldier. Fly steady? The second Pegasus rounded on the first. You just shot a filly. Hellmare. I'd killed the filly, just as surely as Brightwind had. I'd killed her by trying to help. The image of her vanishing in a spreading cloud of pinkish glitter kept playing over and over in my mind. I couldn't think of anything else. The first Pegasus, Brightwind, turned to her accuser. We had our orders, and you will obey them. Now fly steady. She wasn't trying to warn Radar or hide him. She was just scared. I take it back, I cried out silently to Celestia and Luna. I take it back. I didn't try to help. I didn't let her see me. Please bring her back. Please, let me take it back. But no amount of regret or pleading with the goddesses would make the sparkling ash spiral upwards and be reborn in a flash of light. We... we can't know that, soldier. Brightwind insisted defensively. Now either shut up and fly steady, or get your tail back to the raptor and I'll deal with you later. I didn't sign up for this, the Pegasus said, turning away from Brightwind and flying back the way they came. The thunder of the harbor gun signaled the arrival of the raptor. Please tell me that makes another dashite. Please tell me that guy becomes a dashite later. I know that seems cruel to, to the some of the Pegasi. They see that as a sign of bat of of negativity. But if he becomes a Dashite, that's a good. I think that's a good thing. Dashites have been good so far. Friendship City had not given up their resident Dashite. The Enclave began a full attack at the 69th minute mark. I had crawled over to the ashes of the Arbu Philly, gathering them together with my telekinesis. That's as far as I had gotten when Calamity found me, flying in loaded down with all of our weapons. Little Pip, what are you doing? He shouted, as a lancing blast of crimson magical energy speared through the upper levels of the Pony of Friendship, slicing through homes and catwalks. A Pegasus grabbed me, dragging me away as chunks of walkway and scaffolding came raining down. I... I couldn't find anything to put her in, I said, looking up into the eyes of my friend showing him the glowing ball of ash wrapped gingerly in my magic. It was so small. It seemed hardly enough to have once been a filly. Calamity sat me down in the shelter of sparkles as another blast from one of the raptor's magical energy cannons burnt a hole the size of a chariot through the side of the statue, engulfing warm smiles in. If there were any ponies inside, they were incinerated within seconds by the fuchsia-colored flames. Calamity looked at the ash I was holding, his bewildered expression shifting to wounded understanding. He looked around and dug an empty Sparkle Cola bottle out of a trash bin. Here, little Pip. Put her in here. My world had become that ash. With gentle reverence, I magically funneled the filly into the bottle. It glowed an off pink. I floated out a bottle cap, screwing it on tightly. Okay, little Pip. She's taken care of now. Calamity was telling me. I need you back. I know it's hard, and I know it hurts. But we need you here now. I stared at him, wondering how he could be so close, and yet so far away. Do you understand me, little Pip? We need you right now. All around us, ponies were fleeing in terror, trying to get to the exits. They didn't care that there weren't enough boats. The thundering of the harbor guns was thinning out. Calamity slapped me hard across the face with his forehoof. I gasped, lifting a hoof to my cheek in surprise. I could hear screams and explosions nearby. Pony lives are counting on you, little Pip, Calamity said, drawing my attention to a focus. Y'all gotta pull yourself together. Hurt tomorrow, help today. I slowly nodded, 
coming to my senses like a swimmer fighting her way to the ocean surface. Tucking the bottle of ash into my saddlebags, I looked to Calamity. What can I do to help? Calamity smiled, looking ready to collapse in relief. I came in here with three raptors, Radar told us as we reached one of the sniper platforms in the crown of the Pony of Friendship. Harbor guns took down one of them. I looked into the sky at the two dark warships hovering over Friendship Island as dozens of pegasi swarmed about the statue. Chief Lantern and two security ponies fired at the attacking Enclave soldiers as quickly as they could find targets, ducking behind low barricades as the pegasi returned fire. Behind me, Calamity swiftly assembled Spitfire's thunder. The cannons of the left raptor flashed, sending magical energy blasts into the statue, tearing through its reinforced copper skin and into the city beyond. The other raptor floated impassively. That second raptor stopped firing after taking out the last of the harbor guns, Radar informed me. We need to take out that last raptor. Shaking his head, he added, Really wish I knew why they were so hard to get me. Radar looked at me apologetically. I would have gone out myself, but Fresh Frotter wouldn't let me. Threatened to shoot me if I tried. He looked up. I'd go now, too, but it wouldn't matter any more. He was right. The Enclave had gone this far. They weren't planning on leaving survivors. An Enclave Pegasus pulling a war chariot dove down towards the pony spilling out of the statue. With a kick of her hoof, a door beneath the wagon snapped open, and bombs began to fall. Helpless ponies below were rent apart, their bodies flung in tatters by detonations of savage energy. Calamity stood up, taking aim. Spitfire's thunder tore at the air, the shot piercing he the He was wagon. close to the Enclave. He was close to the Enclave. And he also was on a mission and cantered a lot. He could, they may think he might have information. The explosion ripped apart the sky. That was a good shot. Radar praised gently. Calamity was breathing heavily, looking near tears himself. Not fast enough. Ain't none of this worth me, Radar said. I followed his gaze down to the blasted ground, bloodied with the shredded bodies of innocent ponies. The crushing grief that had overwhelmed my soul was breaking apart, slowly being replaced with a building war cry. This wasn't right. This was evil, and I had to stop it. I think you can turn this whole thing around if he can shut down that last raptor, Radar repeated. I'll do it myself, but... He looked down. Not as fit as I used to be. Looking up again, he added, And not a word of that to Dr. Freshwater, you hear? Well, I'll do it, I told Radar. Turning to Calamity, I've got a plan. I stared at the burning wreckage of the docks. The Enclave had bombed the ships. No pony was getting off this island by boat. The delivery wagon for absolutely everything was scattered in burning fragments across the water, and along with the sagging, demolished piers. I looked at Ditsy Doo with empathetic horror. But the glowing ghoul merely shrugged, writing, It's just a wagon, on her chalkboard. As the glowing pegasus flew out over the devastation, my eyes caught on the sight of something crimson and green floating in the water. A pony's forehoof, bloody and ragged. A memory bubbled to the surface of my brain. Help me, Ambrosia had rasped. She had been dying inside of her armor, pinned by part of the terminal bank, half sunk into the tainted water that was spraying into the room. Her body was already twisted and malformed. I hadn't been able to reach her. I had barely been quick enough spreading Zenith's goop over the ragged stump of my hind leg before I had bled out. I'd downed every healing potion I had, but the loss of blood had left me so weak and dizzy I couldn't levitate anything heavier than one of the coffee cups in the room. 
My blood had left a wet crimson river pouring out from beneath the slab that was holding me down, flowing down into the tainted water, making it pink with the light of my pit buck. Help me, she had whimpered, her voice filled with torment. Please, kill me. I had wanted to. For the love of merciful Celestia, I had wanted to. But shy of trying to beat her to death with a coffee cup, there had been nothing I could do. Then, a voice in my head reminded me that wasn't true. There was one thing I could do. I remembered focusing my magic, lifting up her visor. Her eyes hadn't been in the right places anymore. Only one of them, engorged and strange, had stared out at me, tortured beyond the telling of it. As I stood near the docks, watching that bobbing severed hoof, I recalled thinking, maybe not a sword, but there is enough blood for a dagger. The memory broke, leaving me shaken. I tried to dredge up what had happened next, but there was only blackness where the memory should have been. It took her less than a minute fluttering about the debris and floating crates before our friendly ghoul returned to me, her eyes looking in different directions, a smile on her muzzle and a stealth buck in her hooves. I shook myself from my morbid reverie and added the stealth buck to my other equipment I'd acquisitioned. I shuddered. What had happened to me that I could look at another poor pony's dismembered stump and not want to scream? The equestrian wasteland really had poisoned my soul. Above us, the hostile raptor fired a blast at the crown of the Pony of Friendship, engulfing one of the sniper platforms in deadly magic. I pulled Ditsy Doo with me, taking cover against the copper robes of the statue as chunks of burning flesh rained down. Calamity swooped up next to us, dodging falling debris as he dropped two sets of enclave armor at my hooves, scavenged from the bodies of Pegasi taken out by the snipers. Two? I asked him. I can't wear one of those. I pointed out dryly. Horn. No wings. Ditsy Doo jabbed me with a hoof. What? My eyes widened as I literally put two and two together. Wait. Ditsy, you can't come with us. We're going into a fight. And she's lived for two hundred years, Calamity reminded me. I reckon she can handle herself, little miss, two months out of the stable. Did she do level to look at me as the explosions behind her shook the island? Calamity hefted up Spitfire's thunder, searching for the war wagon on a bombing run. Okay, fine, you're coming. I acquiesced, locking the stealth buck into my pip leg and locking everything we weren't taking, including Calamity's battle saddle in a nearby crate. Suit up. Ditsy Doo gave me a one-hoofed salute and started dressing, hiding her brilliant ghoulish body completely inside the black insectoid armor. This is Raptor Pyrocumulus to Raptor Alto Stratus. Respawn immediately. As Calamity and Ditsy Doo disguised as Enclave soldiers, flew us closer to the black maw of the attacking raptor's hangar. My pit blake had latched onto a new signal, one which wasn't playing the Enclave's continuous public broadcast, and decrypted it. I found myself listening to the Pegasi's inter-warship military frequency. This is Commander Thundershear of the Raptor Pyrocumulus to Commander Icebreak of the Raptor Alto Stratus. Why have you stopped firing? The authoritative voice of the commanding stallion asked, clearly attempting to communicate with the unresponsive Sectin Raptor. You are required to respond. Calamity landed on the Raptor's lower flight deck, dropping my invisible self and the sacks I was carrying onto the black metal floor lined with small pulsing guide lights. He trotted up to the hangar door, looking over the access terminal. I moved up next to him, Ditsy Doo watching our flank as he attempted to hack into it. As expected, the access terminal had a cloud interface. I could offer him advice, but once again, I was denied the chance to do this myself. Commander Thundershear, this is Commander Icebreak. The enemy is defenseless. The battle has been won. Raptor Alto Stratus is standing down. A Pegasus mare replied in a dignified, reserved voice. 
A wing is standing by to retrieve the prisoner as soon as Raptor Pyrocumulus disengages. Ditsy Doo gave a little dance in her armor. Apparently, she was picking up the transmission too. The rebellion of the second Raptor filled her heart with delight. Almost got it, Calamity grunted. I turned back to the terminal, scanning the lines of code he had brought up. Somewhere in that matrix was the password. Commander Icebreak, those are not your orders. Resume firing. With all due respect, Commander Thundershear, no. After two failed tries, we located the correct... Hold on. Uh, did you guys hear that? <sighs> Sorry guys, there's a guy outside with a leaf blower and it's one of the it's one of the the uh, lawn keep the yard keepers. He's cleaning out my gutters right now. So, oh, my God. So, hold on. I'll be right back. This is going to be a quick thing. I'm sorry I'm leaving this in, but I always leave these things unedited, so... Sorry guys, I had a little too much fluids. I'm still gonna need to drink some. Password. Pragmatism. The heavy blast door sealing the hangar slid open. Inside, the high ceiling was laced with humming lights identical to those I grew up with in Stable 2, but more sparsely placed, leaving the hangar feeling dark and cold. Large, heavily armored windows along the roof let in the gray twilight of late evening between mounted magical energy turrets. I imagined that the hangar would have been bright, almost pleasant, if those windows were letting in the pure sunlight of midday above the cloud curtain. Enclave technicians and internal soldiers wearing the light combat version of Enclave armor moved about busily. Rows of war wagons lined the edges of the hangar. Red fire boxes were mounted at intervals along the walls. Racks of bombs stood between the observation windows at the far back. On the other side, Enclave officers split their attention between watching the hangar and monitoring the war chatter. Damn it, Icebreak. Operation Cauterize is in effect. This is straight from the Enclave High Council. The stallion commanding the raptor we had boarded reminded his peer. You have your orders. Now lock on to your targets and resume firing, or you and your entire crew will be guilty of disaffection. Ditsy Doo and Calamity moved off together moving like they had a purpose, like they belonged. So long as they didn't do anything suspicious, they should be ignored. Meanwhile, I galloped silently toward the first war wagon. I only had one standard self bucks worth of time to do this, and I had already spent half of that just getting up here and inside. Raptor Pyrocumulus. The ponies of Raptor Altostratus regret to inform you that we will not slaughter helpless ground ponies no matter what your damned orders say. I reached the first wagon and bucked the switch that opened its bomb door, floating two of the homemade bombs out of the first sack. 
I wedged them up next to the war wagon's payload. The bombs had been built using the schematics for the bottle cap mine that Ditsy Doo had given me. It felt like ages ago. But instead of cherry bombs and bottle caps, these lunchboxes carried explosive munitions used in the, now destroyed, smaller caliber harbor guns. Mayor Black Seas had donated the supplies. Ditsy Doo had helped make them. A lot of them. Phew. <laughs> what? Commander Thundershear sputtered in disbelief as I moved on to the next war wagon. By our great leaders, this is mutiny, Icebreak. Think about what you're doing. They'll have your crew for treason. There was no response from Commander Icebreak or the other raptor. I planted two more bombs and moved to the third war wagon. Shadows played across the hangar. I looked up, watching through the ceiling windows as the huge magical energy cannons mounted on the raptor's top deck swiveled to the left. I could hear the belly-mounted cannons still firing on Friendship City. Raptor Alto Stratus, this is Raptor Pyrocumulus, the commander barked. You will lock onto your targets and resume firing, or we will fire upon you. Finishing with the third wagon, I dashed to the front of the bomb racks, setting bombs as quickly as I could. I spared a glance towards Calamity and Ditsy Doo. They had been waylaid by an Enclave officer who was demanding something of our speechless ghoul. She can't talk, Calamity was saying, prevaricating swiftly. About a wound to the throat. Beside him, Ditsy Doo nodded, eagerly backing Calamity's story. Look, I'm her CO, so anything you need to ask her, you can ask me. The Enclave officer, a youthful gray buck with a black mane and a quill for a cutie mark, looked between my two disguised friends, insisting, We don't have any soldiers on the Raptor Pyrocumulus with that kind of injury. He stared at Calamity suspiciously. And I don't recognize that accent. Where'd you say you were from again? Every pony in the hangar froze, turning their gazes upwards as Raptor Pyrocumulus opened fire on her sister. I scrambled to place my makeshift explosives on the second and third bomb racks. I was getting close to where the officer was interrogating my Pegasus friends. Calamity flapped his wings with irritation. Look, he grumbled. We're from the Alto Stratus. Command over there has gone disloyal. We got out while we could. Well, that is to be commended, the buck told him, wrenching his eyes away from the windows above. But under the circumstances, I'm afraid I'm going to have to place both of you in the brig until the battle's over. The young officer revolved in place, looking for the closest soldiers. Your loyalty will be determined by a tribunal once we're cloudside again. Oh, hell. Calamity hissed as he stepped back, striking down the officer with a sting of his armored tail. Ditsy Doo backtrotted, her body language betraying shock. Time to go, Calamity shouted as bolts of colored light whizzed throughout the hangar, the soldiers and defense turrets reacting swiftly. I floated the signal detonator out behind me, dropping the sack of lunchbox explosives at the base of the last bomb rack, and galloped. Beams of magical energy struck at Ditsy Doo and Calamity, peeling away their protective magically powered armor. One of the shots disintegrated a plate of Ditsy's armor the sickly yellow-green light of your irradiated ghoul body shining out of the hole in the black carapace. I kicked the stealth buck out of my pip leg, giving the turrets and soldiers another target. Thunder rumbled throughout the hangar from outside, as one of the pyrocumulus's cannons struck something vital on the Alto Stratus. Calamity and Ditsy Doo shot out of the hangar, several pegasi in hot pursuit. I felt the first scorching blast lance off my canterlot's police armor, sizzling it as I reached the landing platform. I wrapped myself in magic, making myself weightless, and jumped. Beneath us, the canted form of Raptor Alto Stratus was bellowing smoke, its left side thundercloud dispersed, gaping holes glowing in its framework as it dropped slowly out of the sky. One of the Pyrocumulus's belly cannons swiveled and fired on the ruined warship as it crashed into Friendship Bridge, tearing apart catastrophically. I triggered the detonator. Behind me, light and heat erupted from the hangar of the pyrocumulus, 
a draconic roar building within the cascade of explosions. A blast of fire buffeted me, sending me spinning through the sky. My magic imploding as bomb racks went up like a volcanic Armageddon, magical fire rending the Enclave warship in half. This time, it was Ditsidu who caught me. Her Enclave armor was perforated, her helmet gone. Glowing ichor seeped out of numerous painful wounds, but she was grinning, one of her eyes staring at me as she gave a squeaky victory cheer. My heart lifted at her jubilation, but then sank again as I looked out at the burning pony of friendship, the smoke of an incinerated city and murdered ponies blackly bellowing out of glowing wounds carved by destructive magical energy. We almost made it into Fetlock before the Enclave caught us. It was the dead of night. Thunder clouds above rumbled angrily, still threatening a terrible storm. We had fled Friendship Island, after magically snatching up the crate with all of our belongings, drawing off as many of the remaining Enclave soldiers as we could. Most of them had abandoned the fight when all of their warships had fallen, but a few had been determined enough to continue to mop up and were engaged by the remaining security ponies. Thanks to our help, a little over a quarter of Friendship City's population still survived. Radar and Chief Lantern were not amongst the living. Both were killed when the Pyrocumulus took out their sniper platform. Calamity had become withdrawn and laconic since the news. Survivors were still trapped on the island. The Pyrocumulus had destroyed the docks and boats. The crash of the Alto Stratus had wiped out a section of the bridge. Once we got back to Stable 29, we intended to enlist the aid of Applejack's rangers. I was certain that the needs of nearly 200 suffering ponies would draw Velvet Remedy out of her shell. But Ditsidu was wounded, more than she let on. As we drew close to the edge of Manhattan, she had begun flagging. So we landed in the ruins of a building which, based on the plate and silverware design still visible on the badly deteriorated and half-buried sign, had once been a diner or, from the horseshoe motif running alongside the top of one of its standing walls, possibly a shoe shop. When the ruins had turned up empty, Calamity had taken Spitfire's thunder and had flown into the rubble of the apartment building next door, searching for food, Radaway, and anything else he could find. This left me sitting on the edge of the ruins, staring out across the street. Ditsy Doo had discarded the ruined Enclave armor and was splashing playfully in a glowing puddle of radioactive waste spilled from the back of a wagon bearing the MAS logo. I couldn't help but smile at her antics as the glowing ghoul rolled in the waste, the radiation healing her wounds. This wasn't helping her condition any, but now that the doctors of Friendship City had taught her how to relieve herself of the build-up quickly, Ditsy Doo was considerably less worried. Catching my eye, she shook herself off flinging glowing goop all over the wagon and the rubble around her, then began to trot back to me, closing her eyes and concentrating as she did so. Her body pulsed with a flash of radiation that drove her face planting into the broken asphalt of the street. She stood back up, her eyes reeling in different directions, then giggled at her own clumsiness. As she reached me, she set down her chalkboard, scribbling out, Absolutely everything does not have boats must fix. Don't worry, I assured her. We'll get all of those ponies to safety. Ditsy Doo nodded happily and kicked her chalkboard up, <laughs> dipping her head and expertly catching the neck loop so that it hung against her fleshy breast. Don't move, the armor augmented voice cut through the darkness. I immediately cursed, bringing my eyes forward sparkle up. We have you surrounded. There were red lights all over my compass. I looked towards the crate that still held most of my weapons. I had retrieved little Macintosh, but the zebra rifle and sniper rifle were still inside. I did a quick mental calculation of how many armor-piercing bullets I had left for my favorite gun, how long it would take to reload, and the chances they would kill my now unarmored ghoul companion before I could take them down. With a heavy sigh, I responded, <sighs> We surrender. 
Ditsidu poked at the blue field of our magical energy cage with her forehoof, making an ow sound, something she didn't need a tongue for. I stared through the field at the Enclave soldiers milling about outside. A technician Pegasus sat next to the terminal which controlled the energy cages. There were others, but ours was the only one occupied. I noted glumly that it had a cloud interface. Next to it was an Enclave crate where little Macintosh was imprisoned. My pit buck was clicking steadily. Being locked in here with Ditsy Doo was bathing me in radiation. I noticed gloomily that the scrapes and bruises I had acquired in Friendship City were all fading away, and that my stomach was beginning to churn unpleasantly, threatening to divest me of my precious lunch. Poke. Ow. Poke. Ow. These ponies aren't from the attack on Friendship City. I observed with a whisper, watching an Enclave officer toss her emptied bottle of Sunrise Sarsaparilla into a trash bin that was beginning to overflow. I had glimpsed an Enclave antenna array as they marched us into the cages. They've clearly been camped here for a while now. I looked at Ditsy Doo. Any guesses what they're up to? Ditsy Doo looked at me and shook her head, the last wisps of her mane flapping about. Then, she turned back to the blue crackling wall in front of her. Poke. Ow. A mustard-coated pegasus in light enclave combat armor, identical, I noted, it? to the armor I had first seen Rainbow Dash throwing off to her friends, stopped his walking patrol to lift his visor and glare at Ditsy Doo. Uh, would you cut that out? He growled. Y'all are giving me a headache. Poke. Ow. Hey, he barked at me. Can't you make your little monster knock it off? Nope, I replied, as I caught movement in the corner of my eyes. Gazing out, I saw Calamity moving up on a high ridge of rubble. Our cavalry had arrived. I shifted away and lowered my head, trying to look forlorn and pathetic, burying my face in my hooves to allow myself to serendipitously watch Calamity without alerting any of the ponies keeping an eye on us. Calamity shifted Spitfire's thunder into position, peering down the scope at the Pegasi all around us. I waited, my nerves alive with anticipation. Calamity stared at the other Pegasi, and did not fire. Calamity? I whispered to myself. Slowly, Calamity pulled back, sliding Spitfire's thunder away, and disappeared. Ditsy Doo dropped her chalkboard next to me, he isn't going to rescue us? Calamity, I thought, feeling apprehensive and a little hurt. What are you doing? Two Pegasi in fearsome onyx armor marched Calamity into the camp at the tips of their viciously sharp tails. The rust-colored Dashite walked in front of them, wings held high. Oh, damn it, Calamity. Up you go. One of the Pegasi ordered as the technician lowered the field around one of the magical energy cages. He prodded Calamity up onto the platform, and our Pegasus friend cantered around to stare at him as the blue field washed up between them. I moved as close as our cage would allow. The shielded cage was beginning to feel uncomfortably warm. Calamity! I hissed. What? Calamity just looked at me sadly. Sorry, little Pip. I... I just couldn't. Even after what they did? Are you serious? Calamity shifted uncomfortably and nodded, offering no explanation. But an explanation was forthcoming. Well, look who we have here. It was the Pegasus buck who had growled at Ditsy Doo. He was trotting up, looking like a colt who had just gotten his cutie mark. If it ain't my little brony... His little what now? What? Hello, pride, Calamity said sourly. I see they're letting just any pony into the Enclave these days. Hey, the mustard-colored pony hissed. I ain't the traitor here, now am I? No, you ain't, Calamity jabbed. Y'all just washed out. 
Three times, no less. You know him? I asked. Pride turned to me with a grin. Oh, y'all the friends? I can't hear this. But that! <sighs> We're on half day schedules at work. And these guys are coming earlier than I expected them to be, so... I expect, sorry, later than I expected them to be, not earlier, but I expect them to be more early in the morning than I expect this. He looked from calamity to us and back in exaggerated astonishment. Well, what do you know? Little calamity actually managed to make some friends. He rolled his eyes, adding, A munchkin man and a monster. Pride smirked at us. Y'all should really have chose a better friend, the Enclave Buck said nastily. Calamity here's a flying disaster. Leaning close to me just beyond the blue field, Pride nickered like he was about to tell me a secret. I stood up, glaring through the energy barrier at him. You know why Father named him Calamity? The Buck asked far too loudly. Father? Pride was Calamity's brother? No wonder he wouldn't shoot. I suddenly flashed back to the first argument Velvet Remedy had with us about eating meat. Oh, we can eat meat all right. Just don't much like to. Ain't really good for our diet. Calamity had asserted. My brothers used to challenge me to hot dog eating contests all the time, which mostly meant them shoving the disgusting things down my throat. Calamity's brother grinned maliciously. It's cause he killed our mother coming out. I dropped back on my haunches, the cruelty of Pride's claim knocking the wind from me. The little pony in my head cried at the pain such vicious words must be causing my best friend. But Calamity only looked bored. That again, he drawled, unimpressed. You ain't seen me for six years, and in all that time you can't come up with anything new? The orange-maned Pegasus shook his head. Back when I was a blank flank colt, and y'all tell me that, I ball for hours. But case you ain't noticed, that was a long time ago, and I ain't a little full no more. Pride sneered. Really? Strange. I don't see no cutie mark on you, baby brother. Calamity rolled his eyes. Yeah, and you know exactly why, he spat. The mustard-coated enclave pony laughed, stomping a hoof on the ground. Uh-huh, that I do. He peered into Calamity's cage, at his little brother. And I should be thanking you. Branding that cutie mark off your flanks was my rite of passage into the enclave. I reeled. Calamity's own brother had branded his cutie mark off. Then again, y'all should be thanking me, Pride snarked. Who wants a picture of a hammer on the flank anyways? He swiveled back to Calamity. Ow. That's got a sting, you know. That's a reference and from the show. Oh my god, I remember that. That was a reference. Uh, one of the community work crusaders, who wants a picture of a hammer on their frank flank anyway? That was a thing they said. Thinning your own kind, becoming a filthy traitor, when all you had to do was wait a few more years. My loyalty was, and always has been, to the ponies of Equestria. Calamity glared back. Ain't my fault the Enclave's allegiance is only to itself. If they were what they pretended to be, they'd have been down here with me all the time. Still sprouting them horse apples, little brother? Pride jabbed. Well, case y'all missed it, we're here now. So, Pride, Calamity asked tiredly. What's this all really about? Cause it ain't the Grand Pegasus Enclave swooping to the rescue. I ain't seen a single civilian. This is a military operation through and through. Pride nickered. <coughs> Haven't y'all been listening to the radio? There's a bastard pony named Red Eye who's messing with shit that ain't his to mess with. You mean the single? Calamity quickly corrected himself. Sustainable Pegasus Project. 
Yep. Something he did alerted the higher ups, and they started digging into all the shit he's been doing with one of our towers. None too bright, that red eye. Left us all sorts of clues as to what he's been digging in. I frowned. Careless wasn't Red Eye's nature. On the other hoof, if the Enclave could override DJ Pony's signal from the MAS EBS, they could very well possibly be able to access things Red Eye reasonably expected to be secure. Or, Red Eye could be setting them up somehow. From what I saw in Friendship City, the Enclave was sowing the seeds of their own destruction just being here. And that was before taking into account what my friends and I were going to do to them. And what's that got to do with blasting the royal city off the side of the mountain? Calamity questioned. Why don't y'all just fly over and kill him then? What's Operation Cauterize? Pride pulled up short. Where'd you hear that? Oh, I have my sources. Calamity said cryptically, holding a hoof to his breast. Pride glared at my friend for a good spell before finally saying, Don't do the Enclave no good to just kill the bastard. Even if we take him down, some ponyos might step up into his footprints and try to finish what he started. So, what? They had to take out Red Eye and Stern? To protect the Enclave and the Pegasi race, we gotta take out Red Eye, all those you might have told and any pony else who might know about the Sustainable Pegasus Project," Pride said firmly. And then we get rid of the last Earthside hubs of the damn Ministry of Awesome so no pony can ever stumble across what Red Eye did. Goddesses. That was why they were after Radar. He'd been in the MAW. There would be Enclave troops hunting us down for that same reason. The gears in my mind started churning. Homage was a target, too. Who else? The little pony in my head started piecing together a picture that filled me with dread. The Enclave had tried to wipe Friendship City off of the map. Tends not to leave loose ends, the voice I now recognized as Commander Thundershear had said. He didn't want to just murder Radar. He might have told other members of the science team. And they might have told friends or family. In Thundershear's mind, the whole city was infected, and they all had to perish. How many degrees of separation before the Enclave wouldn't consider some pony a threat? How far were they planning to go? Y'all are talking about mass murder, Calamity breathed. There ain't no way the Enclave thinks they can be Equestria's savior after this. His eyes narrowed, his gaze sharper than a dagger. But then... They don't have a plan on rejoining the Questria, do they? Pride gave Calamity a pitying look. So what's the plan then? Calamity stomped. Civilians gotta see something's up. The Enclave planned to write this off as some big scout mission. Oh, we thought that maybe it was time for us to descend, but after a prolonged exploration we realized that just ain't feasible. Best we just wait another 200 years. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, Pride said dismissively. We sat in our magical cages in silence as dawn began to color the horizon. I was supremely tired, but none of us actually felt like sleeping. Calamity had apologized again, several times in fact, until I had nearly shouted at him that it was okay. I'd spent the last two hours contemplating how I could levitate the weapons I could get my magic on and use them to wipe out the camp. Right now, while most of it was asleep, I figured I had a good chance of pulling it off. But then, we'd still be stuck in these cages. I wiped the sweat from my forehead, trembling slightly. My EFS was warning me that my radiation exposure had reached critical levels. I had to try something, but it would have to be something that worked. I wouldn't survive in here long enough to get another chance. Ditsy Doo was huddled in the far corner of the cage, keeping away from me as best she could. But in this small space, it didn't really matter. Calamity was laying down in his cage, looking absolutely morose. I'm sure Pride is wrong, I told my friend through the shields between us. About your father, I mean. He wouldn't have named you after the death of your mother. 
Calamity's muscle gave a wry smile. I could never bring myself to ask, but know my father, he probably did. Luna's mercy. That was... horrible. I'm sorry, Calamity, but I kind of hate your father right now. Calamity smiled, sitting up. That's okay, little Pip. He'd be happy to hear it. I winced. Every pony hates my father. That's his job. Most loathed bastard in the Enclave. Your father is the Enclave, too? I breathed, my mind suddenly conjuring up images of Calamity's father as a member of the Enclave High Council. Possibly even the stallion behind Operation Cauterize. Goddesses, don't put Calamity through that. It's not fair. Yep, Calamity said, a grim little smile playing over his face. Drill Sergeant at Navarro. He stood up, raising his wings and dropping his voice mockingly. A hammer? Your cutie mark is a fucking hammer? That'd better be the hammer down your enemies, boy. Or you're the sorriest excuse for a son that I ever did see. Wow. Calamity sat back down, chuckling a little despite himself. Yep, that's my dad. He shook his mane, looking at me. Any surprise all four of his bucks end up in the Enclave? Suddenly, my mother felt like a blessing. So, I said, trying to strike up conversation while I searched for a solution to our predicament. Your cutie mark was a hammer, huh? Calamity looked up. Yup. And a screwdriver. Your cutie mark was... tools? Well, it wasn't quite what I expected. I would have imagined my friend with crosshairs on his flank. Or a bullseye. Although, that would hardly be the best thing to be sporting on your flank in the equestrian wasteland. Still, this was Calamity. The pony who delighted in fixing up the Sky Bandit and making it fly again. The one who put on armor and a pony rack. Who'd repaired everything from firearms to dresses. I thought of him as a sharpshooter. But, thinking about it, I realized that every weapon he had used aside from Spitfire's Thunder was a weapon he had modified or built himself. He'd even jury-rigged his Enclave armor to allow him to shoot it without wearing the helmet. Ditsy Doo trotted up, pressing her chalkboard against the shield, making it crackle. Calamity appeared, reading. Story. He looked at me, baffled. Cocking my head, I guessed what Ditsu had wanted. I think she wants to hear your cutie mark story. With a smile, I added, I think I do too. Ah, uh, cutie marks don't matter. Calamity told us drearily. Oh, come on. I encouraged, clopping my hooves on the floor of the cage. Come on, now it's story time. I want to know, Ditsy wants to know, just tell us. Ditsy Doo joined in with hoof clops of her own. Calamity rolled his eyes and shot me a look. Uh, fine, but y'all gotta share yours too. He tipped his desperado hat, thinking. When I was a little colt, Calamity began. All I wanted to do was make my father proud of me, which was damn near impossible, even for my big brothers. I was never going to be as big or as strong as them, so I practiced shooting. First year I tried the young sharpshooters competition, I came in third. Father was disappointed, to say the least. I winced. I tried to tell him I tried my best but he told me that meant my best was pathetic. I said it wasn't my fault. That the old gun he'd given me was all weighted funny and hard to aim. He told me I should have fixed it better then. Calamity shook his head, digging a hoof at the cell floor. So that's what I did. I spent all year tinkering with that gun, fixing the sights, building a custom muzzle grip, adding weight to the shoulder brace so it was more balanced. Next year, I placed first. Calamity looked up at me, with tears in his eyes. That... 
That was the first time my father ever smiled at me. First time he ever told me I'd done good. He stared into the morning sky. The rising sun was painting the clouds with glorious oranges and pinks and golds. When I got home, I took off my competitor's burden, and there they were. A hammer and screwdriver. The best day of my life. He looked down, reached back a hoof to ruffle his mane. Till I met Velvet and y'all, of course, that is. Well, I was dead last among my peers to get my key to Mark. I told them. All the other Colts and Phillies in my class had gotten their key to marks a full two years before, and the Overmare wanted to put me to work. I explained. Normally, in Stable 2, we're assigned our jobs we would have the rest of our life based on our cutie marks. Without mine, the Overmare couldn't assign me one. So she drew on some ancient bylaw created by Stable 2's first Overmare, which allowed me to have temporary apprenticeship under a variety of positions, at least until I found something that sparked my cutie mark to appear. Mostly, she had me try out a number of administrative or technical apprenticeships, since those were the areas most unicorns were assigned to anyways. I looked down at the pit buck grossly infused into my flesh. We were supposed to get our pit bucks after we got our key marks and our job assignments. Biting my lower lip, I thought back. One day, while I was apprenticing with the head pit buck technician, a worried couple slipped into the pit buck technician's stall. Their son had gone missing. He had run off during his cutie mark party. Somehow he'd got himself lost in the stable and they couldn't find him. Calamity was staring at me, a little bewildered. He remembered how small and enclosed the stables were compared to the outside world. One of the most overlooked capabilities of pit bucks is that they can track tagged objects. Mostly this is used for the auto mapper. My pit buck came loaded with a whole slew of preset location tags. I'm still getting surprised by occasional you are here messages on my eyes forward sparkle. I smiled a little, remembering how astonished I was that my pit buck knew the name of Sweet Apple Acres. Every pit buck has a tag, which would allow any pony with that tag code and another pit buck to locate them. My mentor was asleep, which wasn't that uncommon for him. So I hacked into his terminal and downloaded the tag code for the Colt's new pit buck into one of the ones I had been working on. I took the tools that allowed me to unlock it and put the pit buck on, bringing up an ice forward sparkle for the first time. Keying the EFS compass to the Colt's tag, I slipped through the stable until I found him. The Colt had managed to get himself locked in the maintenance shed for the apple orchard. It was after hours and no pony had been around to hear his banging and yelling. I didn't want to get the Colt in trouble. So instead of fetching one of the gardener ponies, I picked the lock and got him out myself. I gave a weak grin. Of course, he went and told every pony how I had rescued him, and so I got in trouble for appropriating the pit buck and picking the lock. But at least my mentor covered for me about the hacking. And the overmare wasn't going to press the issue, seeing as how my new cute mark dictated that I would be with him for a very long time. Smiling softly at the memory, I concluded... It was the first time I'd ever felt like I'd done something useful. Something really... good. I don't think either of us have been expecting Ditsy due to join in the storytelling. Hell, we couldn't even tell what the ghoul's cutie mark had been. So both Calamity and I were surprised when the glowing Pegasus dropped her chalkboard at my hooves and prodded me to read. And then prodded me harder, reminding me to read aloud so Calamity could hear. It took a great many pauses while Ditsy Doo wiped the chalkboard clean and wrote a few more words before a simple story was told. Uncle owned a moving wagon company. Uncle let me help. He didn't let me do much carrying, said I was clumsy. But he let me ride around in the wagon and called me his little mascot. I liked it. It was fun to help ponies move into a new home. I liked seeing them happy, especially families. Super especially when they had fillies or colts my age. Once, there was a family who was sad about moving. They had a little filly and a littler colt, but they were scared of me because my eyes were different. So I made funny faces and got them to laugh at me. Then they were happy. 
Then I took them back to where Uncle kept all the packing supplies, and I showed them the most fun thing in the entire world. Bubble wrap. They loved popping all the bubbles, especially little Pokey. We had fun all day long. Uncle told me that was when I got my cutie mark, but I was having way too much fun to notice. I had almost come up with a plan when Pride snuck past our cages into the terminal. Poking it with a hoof, he brought down the walls of magic. You know, that is the only explanation for that cutie mark I've ever heard. For uh, Ditsy. That is, uh, uh... That is the only explanation I've heard for the uh, cutie mark. She has the bubbles. Actually, no, wait, it's the second one. The first one... The first one was explained in when Derpy had a daughter in a in one of the universe. I think it was where the alternate, you know, um, elements of harmony came in. I've been watching it and and um, trying to keep up with it. I haven't been watching it lately, but I remember that was one of the things in it. So, but this is the second one I've heard, which is a lot more believable than that one. Which so this one makes more sense. So. Calamity jumped up, leaping off of the cage platform. What the hay is going on? Just go, Pride hissed. I whispered to Calamity, pointing at the enclave crate that little Macintosh was locked away in. Open that, Calamity said, pointing his hoof, and we will. Pride gnashed his teeth in exasperation and went to work on the crate. So... Calamity said as the crate hissed open. I floated out little Macintosh and the few other items they had taken from Ditsy Doo and me. We, uh, escaped? Yeah, something like that. I don't know, but y'all go get. Pride looked around nervously. Listen, word just came down. Operation Cauterize has been extended to all Dashites. Next time I see you, I'll be shooting you. Understand? Calamity nodded. Gee, I have the sudden and unnatural urge to hug you, big brony. Ditsy do moved up, holding her chalkboard. In okay, her okay, I have to say this once right now. Okay, K Cat, you wrote that in. You wrote that in purposely. You wrote that in purposely, not because it's a brother thing, but you put that in there for bronies, just to make them fanboy a little bit. You did that purposely. Just for that. I feel that. With two words written across it. New Appaloosa. Pride gave us an ugly look. Red Eye's favorite trade in town? The one that gave him the bomb he set off, assassinating a member of the High Council? Enclave dispatched a full regiment there at first light. Ditsy do stumbled back at the news. The chalkboard dropping from her muzzle. No. Monster. Pride said darkly. I'd be surprised if there's even a crater left by now. Ditsy's eyes were wide, her pupils huge and centered dead ahead, seeing something beyond Pride, a strangled squeak coming from her throat. She didn't need to speak for me to know the one thing on her mind. Silver Bell. No! I heard the Lavender Philly's voice from two days before, crying out, Mommy. Ditsy do broke into flight, headed for New Appaloosa. Calamity scooped me up, giving chase, diverting only far enough for me to telekinetically scoop up Spitfire's thunder from the rubble where he'd left it. Four raptors were positioning themselves over a new Appaloosa, squads of black-armored pegasi flying about the sky between them. The town was still standing, but we could see Enclave soldiers swooping to strike down ponies who were trying to flee the walls. Ditsy-Doo pulled up, hovering in the air, a look of dismay etched on her face. Calamity bristled, his eyes narrowing in anger as a pegasus dove down at a running mare, opening up with a rapid-fire burst of light that turned the fleeing pony into glowing blue dust. Damn it, little pip, we gotta stop this. He was near the breaking point. I could hear it in his voice. Before we could react, Ditsy Doo zoomed forward again, flying right into the heart of the Enclave forces. The Pegasi whipped about as the glowing one shot past them. They started chasing her, but quickly stopped shooting after their first blasts missed and hit one of the raptors. 
Calamity set me down and started off after her, but I grabbed him by the tail with my teeth. Whoa, 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 Calamity, stop. That's suicide. I knew we were about to lose Ditsy Doo, and probably Zenith and Silverbell. I was damned if I was going to lose Calamity too. We need a plan, Calamity. Don't just rush in blindly. Here's this. Ditsy I don't stop. think Zenith and Silverbell are dead. Here's my opinion, because I know Zenith isn't going to die without a fight. Okay, Zenith is gonna must have found must have saw this coming. Found must have saw it coming. Found a way to get her and Silverbell out, and probably some other people too. She probably found a way out and escaped somewhere. That is my opinion. She's probably actually looking for Little Pip now. That is my theory. That or she's hiding away somewhere until Little Pip can find her. Probably leaving us signals that Little Pip can identify that it's Zenith. Stopped in the center of the Enclave forces. They had her surrounded, but they couldn't risk shooting her without hitting their own. Several armored Pegasi moved in, their tails curling to strike as soon as they got within range. Foosh! A burst of light and radiation from the glowing Pegasus sent the encroaching Enclave Pegasi reeling as Ditsy Doo shot almost straight up into the air, beating her nearly featherless wings as fast and as hard as she could. The Enclave Pegasi gave chase. They started to fire again, but Ditsy Doo repeatedly blasted out radiation, each time blinding her pursuers as it shot her up higher and higher. Wait. Two of the raptors swiveled their topside cannons she around, doing what I think she's scorching doing? the air with magical death. But the huge weapons were far too inaccurate to hit their quickly ascending target. After a half dozen missed shots, they left the escaping ghouls of the black armored soldiers chasing after her. The glow of Ditsy Doo illuminated a dark patch of storm clouds as she disappeared into them. Then, the glow faded, and she was gone. The ponies following her stopped, hovering in the air. Several began to turn back. Inside, I knew that she would at any moment break through the top of the cloud curtain and see the sunlight for the first time in probably two hundred years. The little pony in my head began to shed a tear. Then, reality snapped back. Ditsy Doo had distracted the Enclave. She'd given us a window, and we were missing it. Okay, I said quickly to Calamity as I slipped the MG Stealth Buck 2 onto my malformed pip leg. Here's the plan. Whoa, Calamity said, looking up. I turned, following his gaze, as a spot of golden green light dropped out of the clouds. I knew what it was, but I still lifted my binoculars to be sure. The first drops of the promised storm began to fall. Ditsy Doo had broken back through the cloud curtain, shooting past the top tier of hovering Enclave soldiers before they could react. The ones who had started back down turned and sped in to catch her. Foosh! The pulse of radioactive light sent the black armored Pegasi spinning out of control as she shot ahead like a rocket. The other Pegasi were reacting now, chasing after her, firing beams of multicolored light. What is going on? Most missed. I gasped as some did not. Whoosh. Ditsy Doo jolted ahead, moving even faster. She was aiming right for the center space between the Enclave's raptors. The raptors were in position now. Their belly cannons were taking aim. Ditsy Doo is a complete badass right now! Cleanse the town off the face of Equestria. My plan was forgotten as quickly as I had formed it. All I could do was watch. Whoosh. Ditsy was beyond the reach of her pursuers now, but not, it appeared, beyond the reach of their weapons. One of the Enclave ponies fired twin missiles at the ghoul Pegasus as she streaked by, seeming nothing more than a glaring blow. The missiles spun, magically locking onto her. They spiraled around each other, leaving a double helix of smoke in their wake as they chased her. Foosh. The missiles were undeterred and gaining speed, closing the distance as Ditsy Doo beat her wings, arrowing down at the Enclave about to destroy her town and kill her daughter. She was moving so fast the odd air of the equestrian wasteland seemed to be warping around her. Her body was glowing brighter and brighter as she focused, building up for another burst. 
The sickly light pouring off of her body was rippling in the air, shearing off of her in washes of unearthly diseased colors. The missiles seemed to reach her at the same time she reached the raptors. Ditsy-Doo exploded. <coughs> what? Okay, I'm reading the next name of the chapter. Sonic Radboom. Sonic Radboom, it's called. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> if I am correct, was that a Sonic Radboom? Because that's the next name of the chapter, and... Of the next chapter. Name of the next chapter. I can't English right. Oh, God. Ugh. Son of a bitch. Ditsy Doo just became an ultimate badass right there. Uh. Well, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoy this awesome chapter of Fall Equestria, and I hope to see you guys in the next one. So, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye!